In 2020, the expected global expenditure on prescription drugs was somewhere around $1.3 trillion, with around $350 billion of that spending being done in the United States. The U.S. seems to have a particular issue in this area, with citizens paying much more than their counterparts in similar countries. And why do some cost so much more than others? Thanks in part to support from the NIHCM, that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Drug manufacturers are basically allowed to change their prices whenever they want, and change them they do. Between January 2022 and January 2023, we saw price increases for over 4,200 drugs. To be fair, there were decreases too, but only for around 1,600 drugs. And those increases, some drug prices increased by over 3,000%. And around half of the drugs that increased in price increased at a rate faster than that of inflation. According to the U.S. Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation, this period saw a blood pressure medication take the cake for biggest percentage increase, going from $4.32 per dose to a whopping $158 for highest increase in dollars, a drug treatment for spinal muscular atrophy saw a $63,750 increase during this period. And beyond these types of increases, many drugs hit the market at high prices right away. And just to add a little insult to injury, these launch prices increased by about 20% per year between 2008 and 2021. So, what are some of the biggest factors that influence prices? To begin, we should address how costly and time-consuming it is to bring a drug to market. One 2020 estimation of the median cost per drug brought to market in the United States was close to $985 million, and the whole process can take somewhere between 10 and 15 years. So, pharmaceutical companies invest large amounts of time and money bringing drugs to market, and only a portion of those drugs actually ever make it. We certainly can't blame them for needing to recoup some cost. However, the research and development process includes a lot of research that's generally funded with taxpayer dollars, so it's public investment on the line here too. So why do Americans face such a battle in getting reasonably priced drugs? One issue is that pharmaceutical companies have serious lobbying power. A 2020 paper examining public data between 1999 and 2018 reported that the pharmaceutical and health product industry directed over $4.5 billion to U.S. federal drug lobbying efforts. In addition to that, presidential and congressional candidates, national party committees, and outside spending groups received over $400 million in contributions, and state candidates and committees were the beneficiaries of contributions totaling nearly $900 million. And these contributions are calculated. Not just any old member of Congress gets a slice of these funds. They're targeted at people and groups who hold the reins when it comes to drafting laws and other regulations related to healthcare and drugs. Another major issue, monopolies. And related to the issue of monopolies, patent abuse. When a company files a patent for a new drug in the United States, they are given exclusive rights to develop that drug and sell it at whatever price they want for a full 20 years. So, if they file a patent and then spend 10 years getting the drug to market, they have an additional 10 years to sell the drug with zero competition. Monopoly. This is considered by many to be a reasonable incentive for companies to invest in the research and development of newer and better drugs. What company wants to sink millions of dollars into an innovative drug idea that anyone can then run off with and sell at competitive prices? However, Abuse of the system means that monopolies over drugs can far outlive that 20-year mark with consumers paying the price. Companies can, and often do, move beyond these primary patents and file secondary patents. A primary patent protects a drug's active ingredient, where a secondary patent protects other drug factors, covering things like drug administration, dosage, and what disease it treats. While there are some perfectly acceptable cases of this kind of secondary patent usage, many people believe that it's a tool often used to abuse the system. One 2023 paper from the UCLA Anderson School of Management reported that the cost of these extensions for U.S. consumers is somewhere around $52 billion, and that estimate is tied to a study of only 355 drugs limited to a specific number of years, so that's $52 billion is probably a conservative estimate. And it's no secret that companies do this. It even has a name, strategic patenting. 
Those feeling more generous toward the practice call it life cycle management, and those with more negative feelings may refer to it as evergreening. Whatever the name, it's a problem for all of us. Beyond the extended cost of the consumer, it has been suggested that this practice squashes innovation, the very reason these patents exist in the first place. We can't cover all the nooks and crannies of drug pricing without creating a feature-length movie, so we thought we'd dedicate the rest of our time here to potential solutions. This can be summed up in the big picture with three words, major policy reform, and four more words on so many levels. Reforming policy to reduce the initial expense of drug development by streamlining policies and requirements between countries and minimizing red tape that doesn't support safety and efficacy standards. There also needs to be a lot more political transparency on both ends. The companies spending money on lobbying and the people and organization receiving those funds should be held to a high level of transparency. For the issue of monopolies, we need patent reform that focuses on the length of primary patents and more importantly, on regulating the use of secondary patents, including penalties for purposeful delays of competition coupled with streamlined approval for competing generic drugs. And then basic things like capping price increases for patented drugs and instituting value-based pricing in the United States, which is essentially pricing a drug based on the size of the benefit it provides. And to end on a high note, the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act addresses drug price hikes that exceed the inflation rate by requiring drug companies to pay rebates to Medicare in such cases. The act also allows Medicare, for the first time, to negotiate drug prices. This process will start with one cycle of just 10 drugs with negotiated prices not going into effect until the beginning of 2026. That's slow progress, but it is progress. Let's keep swimming. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You're going to want to catch all the remaining parts of this series. It's a whole thing. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the video. Subscribe to the channel down below. Maybe go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.